The following show contains views and opinions that may not be suitable for all audiences. Audience discretion is advised. Welcome to the Poor Charlie Podcast, everybody. I am your host, Gomer the Ranting Thespian, and with me this week is Julia. Hello. <laughs> Missed Mickey there, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we all do that. Um, and for the third time in a row, we, we've not had Namio because her life is just not working to her scheduling at this point. But uh, hopefully we will have her next week, and if this starts becoming a broken record, we're going to have issues. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to doubt she even exists. Oh, she exists. <laughs> oh, believe you me. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, if you're watching this on the YouTube or on the site or whatever, or if you're just looking at it on your iPod or whatever and you can see it, there is a shiny new title card. It's like fucking fucking awesome title card we finally get up there by the adorable and lovely Becky Hopkins and 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 all of that good stuff in fact if you're looking at the title card over in the lower right that's where you can go and you can maybe talk to her about commissioning something mm, go do it <laughs> it is very much worth it oh yeah and another thing that that's new starting with this particular show you'll notice that the uh, audio bumper is a bit different um, yes, because that particular uh, segment of Audio Nectar is the cat, one of my co-hosts on Thespian Talk, and she has done bumpers for all my shows, and, and it's amazing and awesome, and I don't have to motor mouth all of my Patreon stuff at the end of the show anymore. <laughs> so that's going to be awesome. Uh, but, so before we get into this week's uh, General Hospital, uh, how, how has your week been, Julia? Uh, pretty good. Uh, Which was excellent. Hey! Uh, and yours? Yeah, Halloween down here. <laughs> really? Wow. What a thought. Yeah, I know. It, it, <laughs> see, Halloween down here didn't exist as it's supposed to. I ranted about it a little bit on Thespian Talk. And um, down here in, in, in the uh, taint of Florida, this little podunk town I live in, they decided to celebrate Halloween on Thursday. Now, of all the trick-or-treating, the trunk-or-treating, where... You, you know, the kids go to the park and they get candies from the back of various vehicles. All safe and sanctioned. Nobody's getting kidnapped or anything. You know, all safe and sanctioned. They did all that on Thursday. The reason why they did it on Thursday is because there was a fucking high school football game on Friday. <laughs> wow. Because that is just apparently that goddamn important. I don't give a shit about high school football. I gave, I gave a shit when I was in high school and I was in the band, sure. But I don't think I gave enough of a shit to say, yeah, you know, everybody come Let's to the football. Move Halloween, yeah. Yeah, just no. That I it's to me is as stupid as moving it if it's on a Sunday. You know, it's like, eh. and I've and I've noticed that it's only since that I've actually remembered it, um, you know, being a problem like as an adult, as a teenager, and on and on forward. So it's like I don't remember it being a problem with it being on Sunday as a kid. So, but then again, I'm also a military brat, so it could have been just, you know, regional differences. And kids go out, you know, early when it's still light out. Adults care when it, typically when it's uh, later and they want to go out and they can't on a work night. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, but some do anyway. <laughs> a lot of people do anyway. Going to work hungover. Oh! Uh, speaking of hungover. <laughs> and drunk. Um, well, we're, we're actu we actually have a good segue to actually start talking about this weekend. We have the return of Lord Larry Ashton. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a fun reveal. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never seen him, uh, never seen him on the show before, when he, whenever he, the last time he was on. And I, I, like, I like him. I mean, not like as a person, but as a character, he's a lot of fun. He, you know, gets under Tracy's skin. Um, watching Ned kind of like, you know, when uh, Lulu was like, who is this? Like, where's my father? And he's like, yeah, this is my father. Just the way he said it, like, no, uh, not no feeling, but, you know, he's yeah. just like, yep, that's that guy again. Great. Yep. Oh, boy. And and I have a feeling that that is alcoholic and, and, and drunk as, as Larry is coming off right now, 
I'm still holding on to the idea that he is the real identity of fake Luke. Really? And that and that this is a ploy, and this is all a ruse. Hmm. I was gonna say because I was about to bring up like I think that's uh, ruled your theory out, but I guess you know if this is a a ruse, that's possible. Yeah, because I've noticed you know fake Luke, he's, he's kind of kind of good with the ruse and everything. I mean, hi, it's you know between him and Julian, they got managed to get uh. Uh, uh, Rick, you know, convicted and subsequently supposedly killed beca- for being, you know, the Julian's, uh, you know, the, the Jerome's uh, crime boss. Uh, and I swear, I've not had any alcohol yet. I can speak. <laughs> you don't think um, that fake Luke would think this is a little bit undignified for him? He strikes me as someone who's very, who thinks very highly of himself. Well, yeah. But time will tell. I mean, and sometimes you have to you have to do a little thing to keep up the ruse or whatever. Uh, although Jerry, Jerry Jacks, master of the exact word, apparently. <laughs> I told you I'd give you your husband. I didn't say which one. It's like, ah, oh, he exact worded them. <laughs> oh, and uh, something we did forget to bring up last week was uh, Nathan. Because uh, once he realized Nina was up and walking around, and he and he had, and he knew that Silas had been attacked by her, he started looking all over Port Charles for Nina. You know, asking his asking Madeline, okay, you know, you know, if you see her, let me know that sort of thing. Not knowing that Madeline is working with Nina. You know. Right, but you know, kudos to him for, you know, finding out that something's a little off, and instead of you know sticking his head in the sand for weeks, mm-hmm. kind of getting right on it and trying to find her and figure out what's wrong and get to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. If people had started doing that once they realized something was off with Luke, they would have been figuring this all out way sooner. Oh yeah, definitely. (laughs) Uh, There are ways to bring out the drama. Uh, Everybody's sick of their head in their sand. Not necessarily the best thing. Nathan running around? Pretty good. And, and, And you have excuses for the actor, like if he needs to take time off or whatever, then that's a very convenient way to let him do that. I think, you know, because you could say, yeah, he's looking for somebody, even if it's just in the same town. Yeah, he's he's busy looking for Nina, mm-hmm. who who got, um, you know, within, within the past week, she she and uh, Martha all, all were hiding out in Obrecht's office, making Obrecht's office their, their base of operations. Oh, uh, and, and Nina's... Sorry, did you say Martha? Martha, yeah. Yeah. No, Madeline. Mar- Madeline, yeah. Yeah. Mar- yeah, I, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of uh, how Obrecht calls her and translate that into an English accent, oh. well, American accent, really. But you know, ah, I, I've got I've got Obrecht on the brain because she, <laughs> Obrecht is such a bitch. I, I'm just gonna say it because because of how she's treating Jason in this in this respect. It's like yeah. because you know. Yeah, he has no insurance, no identity, he's no way to pay for it, but he's also got amnesia, and he was run over by a car. I mean, it's just, I, and I, and I understand, I can understand where Obrecht would be coming from, in terms of, you know, like, thinking of the finances of the hospital or what have you, but if she's got access to a lot of this money, that shouldn't be an issue. In fact, I think one of the characters was saying, you know, the reason why, you know, she was made, you know, chief of staff is because of all this money that she put in to help out people like Jason, who either, otherwise can't afford it. And so it's like she's kind of going back on that. Although I have a feeling she's doing that just to spite Liz. I think definitely in part. Um, I would say not a fan of the particular word you used to describe her. Right. But, Fair enough. Um, I, I definitely think that she sees as she sees most people but she definitely sees Liz as someone you know on her shit list let's say Mm -hmm. um and just sort of by extension this guy that Liz is starting to become closer with let's say Mm -hmm. um and I think I I heard um some things about what may may be coming down the line that this turn of events did not surprise me at all um and Obrecht is not, she's never been the warmest, you know, she's never had the greatest bedside manner. No, never. Obrecht bedside manner? What is that? 
Maybe maybe if Franco was sick in the hospital. Yeah. Maybe. She'd have a great bedside meter with him. Oh yeah. She <laughs> Like Jesus, and and yes, we will be getting to Franco. We will have to because we we have more. Like like I'm saying with the with the way they're writing Franco, it, it's very tragic, but it's still fun to watch. You know, because you build, like I said last week, you build him up. You you know, you try to make him a better character, a better person in character, and then things happen. And whether it's because of circumstances or because he you know. The writing takes it to where he just loses his mind and reverts, and it, it's it's like getting a glimpse of knowing a character can be better than what he was, and then saying no, we're going to take him back the other way, and that and I think that's kind of tragic because it, it's like he had it and now he's losing it and he's losing his mind too and 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 it's just uh, I I think it's tragic honestly, uh, still do, you know. <laughs> And I still have no sympathy, so, uh... Yeah. Good, good to know. Yeah. I mean, and and bear in mind, it doesn't excuse his actions and character. It, it right. really doesn't. It's just, you know, that's how I'm seeing it. They, he could have been better, but the writers decided, no, nah, we want to make him a villain again. You know, designated or otherwise. And part of that is breaking Heather out of Ferncliff. Which, which Sean beat him to the punch over does something right for once but it doesn't quite last no it See, doesn't and immediately lets it all go to shit yeah cause yeah they've got Heather in there they're ready to let Heather take the fall and then Sean goes to kill Franco and doesn't do it cause he, he, he falls under a lot of oh I want to say this is kind of a cliche in like action movies or dramatic movies or, or what have you it's one of those dramatic cliches where you have somebody at the point of your gun, you're ready to shoot them and end them right then and there, and you just sit there and talk. Franco is, is sitting there, you know, he, he's like very, at first he's just like, okay, whatever, and he's getting ready for his wedding. He's just just taking it all in stride, just saying, eh, you know, you know yeah, whatever. Okay, so you're gonna shoot me? You're gonna kill me on my wedding day? You know? And he's gonna and he's sitting there having this conversation with a gun pointed at him. <laughs> so so maybe Franco at, at that point was like, yeah, he's not really gonna do it. And then like at the last second, uh, you know, Heather figures out, oh shit, Sean works for Sonny, not for Franco. Thanks to Jordan, you know, snooping around after being suspicious of Sean and whatever he's doing, and and finding Heather. Heather then, of course, being Heather, she ties up Jordan and you know, leaves her there and threatens her life if Sean shoots and kills Franco. Because that's Heather. <laughs> oh. It, interestingly, Franco seemed very relaxed uh -huh. even before Heather called. Yeah. Which, which was interesting, because Sean would have no reason not to follow through prior to Jordan's life being threatened. Right. Um, he, and I think Frank was trying to um, trying to say, like, oh, well, you're going to, you know, ruin, Curly will never forgive Sonny, you're going to ruin their relationship. And I'm like, I don't think Sean cares. No. You know, that's not really going to work as an appeal. He works for Sonny's, carrying out Sonny's orders. And, um, which I think is interesting that no one has brought up in a really long time. I guess they don't think it's relevant any longer. Mm -hmm. But Carly and Sean briefly had a flirtation or whatever. Mm. And I hardly think that Sean would be all that devastated if Carly and Sonny couldn't work out their issues. So I don't know what Franco was playing at, but he seemed very confident that he was not about to die. Yeah, which I gotta say, even if he was wrong, that takes some balls. Yeah. Motherfucker got balls. <laughs> <laughs> If you can say nothing else about him, he's got the balls. And um, and so, of course, Franco, you know, texts Sonny using Sean's phone saying, yeah, Franco's dead. You know, all of that, all of that fun stuff. Meanwhile, Sean goes to rescue Jordan, and he and Jordan get locked up in the room. It's like, god damn it, Sean. Check your surroundings first. Yeah, hi. And at the very least, have a spare key. You know, I mean, I mean, hide it in your shoe or in your sock. 
I mean, especially in your sock or your shoe, nobody's going to want to grab that out of there. With all the walking you do, holy shit. Ugh. I wouldn't want to grab it if I was walking on it. And that's my own stuff, so, you know. Ugh. So that's going to be fun to see how that plays out. Um, and, th and, and then the wedding. The hello wedding. Where things are starting to come to light. Where, you know, like Spencer... Spencer tells Carly about Franco about blackmailing Franco into not saying that he was there, and Franco finally arrives at the wedding after sending Sonny the text that you know he was dead, and and the two of them have a little little spat, and Franco pulls this whole forgive you know please forgive me thing. I was out and I was you know everything there you know you know just just playing off what he has been, and they get to the altar. Everybody. Hmm? Before, before we get to the big the big moment, big I just moment. would also like to point out that Carly, well, rightfully upset, you know, that he was trying to get his hands on the recording and, and blackmail Sunny or get revenge on Sunny or, or whatever, mm -hmm. she she did not seem terribly concerned that he knew that there was a small child hiding in her house and chose to conceal that information from both her and Spencer's dad. Didn't, yeah. Didn't get on his case on that at all. Yeah, that is a little weird. Right. Um, Carly, come on. Priorities. Priorities. Right. I mean, I mean, like you said, justify that she would be upset about the blackmailing thing and, and, and the look in the looking through and, and going through her stuff. Justified, yeah. But there's another thing you could be justified in being angry about. But maybe, you know, maybe the writers dropped the ball and realized, yeah, that couldn't realistic. Uh, well, they're kind of in a corner on that one, I think, because you realistically. You know, that w I think realistically, if somebody was to be in that situation and realize, yeah, not only was he going through my stuff, but he also knew a child was hiding in my house and didn't tell anybody, especially his father who was freaking the hell out, uh, I, I think that would be a deal breaker. Right, and because Carly knows what it's like to have her kids missing or kidnapped or mm -hmm. whatnot in danger. Oh, yeah. Um, and even though she and Nicholas aren't particularly close, she would definitely, you know, be sympathetic. Definitely. Uh, in that situation. But no, don't have time to deal with that on your wedding day, I guess. No. <laughs> Just no. Uh, although, considering what he was looking for, maybe maybe in her mind it was like, oh shit. He was going to give this to Ava fucking Jerome and blow everything out of the water. Right. That may, that may have, at least at that particular moment, taken more precedence in her mind. Whether we think it was right or wrong. Yes. Yes, that is true. You know, and and of course, uh, oh wow, uh, what else is there? What else is there to get up there? Um, Luke, uh, Lucas's plus one is Brad. Well, well, he had a little thing before getting to the wedding to begin with. Um, and let's see, is there anything else before we hit the altar? Anything else? You know, at that particular point, we we know Michael's the best man. Doesn't like it, but he's supporting his mom. Um, uh, Which just makes me love Michael like that much more oh definitely I, you know sometimes i um i like i you know i like michael but sometimes i get a little bit bored with him um just because he's so he's so good and he's just trying to you know do all this stuff in his father's memory and i'm just like okay well i can't, like i can't wait till all the secrets start coming out you know like mm -hmm. give him some more interesting stuff like material to work with oh, yeah. um, but this i thought like we're starting to get there finally um <laughs> And, and this whole best man thing, just you could just see how much it pains him mm -hmm. to be doing this. But he loves his mom, and he wants her to be happy. And I love that kind of that little sort of friendly glare he gave Jocelyn when she was, you know, doing the flowers, and he was like, "Do, do it right." Yeah. <laughs> Make mom happy. Be good just this once. Yeah, and, and everybody's loving Jocelyn, especially with her attitude. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> She is her mother's daughter. Yes. Yes, you... For sure. Oh, you're Carly's daughter. Yeah, how could you tell? All that <laughs> attitude. <laughs> oh. Oh, God. So the altar, it comes. They get up there. Lucy's saying, you know, doing the thing. And Carly says, I do. After a brief flashback to Sonny talking all of the stuff, like, yeah, we're, we're never going to get over this. It's always going to be you and me, blah, 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 blah. Carly says, I do anyway. And then Franco says, hell no. I cannot even tell you how relieved I was. Because 
I, I was convinced that Carly was going to, at the very last second, you know, realize she couldn't go through with it. Mm-hmm. But then she said, I do. And I was terrified because I was like, oh my God, is he going to actually marry her first and then ruin her life? But then she'll still have to be married to him. So I was so relieved when he stopped it right there. Yeah. I had no idea, you know, when he was going, because obviously the video is coming. This, this is kind of a foregone conclusion. I have no spoilers to back me up on this. But the video is coming. And everybody is going to see it. And everybody is going to be in a massive mode of what the fuck. I just have to wonder, okay, A, once everybody is, is done being upset with Franco because of how things you know turned out, how many of them are going to look back and be like, you know, I don't agree with your methods. I, I you know... Doing the nanny cam on, in Carly's necklace, not a good thing. That's pretty obvious. But I can understand what drove you to it. You know, that feeling of betrayal on his part. Um, you know. I don't know. I think there's going to be people, possibly even Michael, huh? who are going to say, well, you know, Franco may be a terrible, awful person, but I'm, but like, thank goodness he did that, you know? Because I think Michael's wants to know the truth. I mean, he's going to be furious at Sonny and Carly. Oh, yeah. But but he wants to know the truth. I, I doubt very many people are going to be sympathetic to Franco. Yeah. Nina will be. Definitely. Um, for sure. Mm-hmm. But even, like, Scotty, I don't know, and Kiki, I think, might be, might be sympathetic, but she also might be really upset with him for blowing... Of Michael's life. Yeah, which is understandable. I don't know how their friendship is going to yeah. proceed from here. Yeah, I'll, and, and a lot of the reactions that are going to come out, both positive and negative, you know, I, I'll, I can look at them and be like, you know, it's very understandable. You know, the, the, these characters, yeah, they would most likely react in this way or that way. And, and just, damn. Oh, and then that's not even the part. The one, the one part about the whole thing you know, when Franco said, hell no, he, he right there on the altar said, asked, you know, how could I marry a lying, cheating whore? Number one, you know, the slut shaming I could do without, you know, the intentional slut shaming I can do without. Uh, but that that's, you know, a thing. And and again, again, doesn't excuse it. I don't even think it justifies it. Maybe. I don't know. But in his mind, that's what he's thinking. That's what he sees. And he's, you know. The thing about Franco, the way he's going now, uh, in in the I, th- I think like deep down he is hurting. He's going about it all the wrong goddamn ways. I'm not gonna lie, but he is hurting, and he is letting that come out again. Like I said, in the ro- most wrong possible ways. You know, with with the destruction, with the imminent destruction of Michael's family. You know, with with the information that Sonny killed AJ coming out, and and everybody knowing that Carly's cheated on him with Sonny again, and the fact that Bobby knew that's gonna that's gonna damage uh, her and Scott. You know, as well. There's yeah. there's a lot of collateral damage. You know, there there is. I just the the more this you know plays out, and the more he. Uh, as he you know goes through with his his plan, the more it's clear to me that he he doesn't he might be hurt, but he doesn't actually love her. I don't think. Yeah. Or if he did, if he did, he doesn't he doesn't anymore. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So it, you know. I I just if you I mean if you really love someone like Carly was able to get over, and I hate that that this that this play out this way with the writing, but Carly was able to forgive and move past everything that he did to Jason, to Sam, to Michael, mm-hmm. and, and you know, moved on from her attempt to kill him, or, or to have him killed, mm-hmm. um, and get to this point where she's willing to marry him, mm-hmm. after all that, and she cheats on him, and, you know, the other everyone else he cares about is fine he's got a job he's good like it might hurt but he's not just gonna hurt her response he's going to damage irreversibly 
her relationship with her son is going to potentially send her and Sonny to jail, although somehow I doubt they're actually going to have to spend time in jail because yeah. it's soap. Um, and they can't lose two such major characters. Yeah. But, you know, like, he it's it's such a severe overreaction. Oh, yeah. And it's co- going to cause so much pain to her that it, it doesn't feel like oh, oh, she's she's cheated on me and I'm going to have a little bit of, like, petty revenge. Like, no, this is, like, severe damage. Oh, yeah. And and, and, and like I was saying, you know, it, it is it is definitely the wrong way to go about it. <laughs> I mean, definitely. I, I, that does not excuse it. doesn't mean it's any less entertaining to watch, though. Uh, but it is definitely the wrong way to go about it. And if, if somebody were to pull this in, in reality, I would probably want to smack him in the head, at the very least. Oh, if this was reality, a good... 70% of the characters would be in jail. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, god damn. Ah, so, so that's going to be, that's going to be fun. I look forward to actually watching uh, tonight's episode. We, for, for those who don't know, we actually record these on Monday. And I look forward to watching today's episode to see how it all plays out. It, it's like, it, it's, it, to, to, to use more of a, a, a sexual metaphor here, it, it's like that moment right before you hit orgasm where they left you and you hope that when it finally happens that it is as big a payoff as you're anticipating if if that makes any sense i'm not even gonna touch that okay <laughs> <laughs> that, that is fine that is fine um but mo- but people out there listening they'll understand um but we went on about franco and all of them and we've got the other psycho running around like I've said, Franco is insane, not stupid, and he is showing his insanity. Nina is insane and kind of a doofus, but somehow effective with help. That's the thing, but that that is one of the main differences between Franco and Nina. Franco is doing this mostly on his own. You know, he, he you know he gets help when he needs it. Nina seems to need help with pretty much everything. I don't know. She took down Ava. You know what? Once her mother got Silas out of the way, mm-hmm. through, by the way, one of the cruelest things I think I've ever seen on this soap. Yeah, that's just, oh. Making, making Sam think that Danny's cancer was back. Yeah, it's like, oh, um, just, oh, Madeline, oh. But, but once they, once she did that, I mean, Nina took Ava out. Oh, uh, yeah. Ava did not stand a chance one-on-one Nina. Yeah. I mean, being pregnant didn't help her. I have a feeling if Ava wasn't pregnant, she probably would have stood a better chance. Because, you know, she's pregnant. She's got to make sure she doesn't right. hurt the baby. You know, if she's not pregnant, hey, there's no baby to worry about. Time to go all out. Mm. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think non pregnant Ava could probably take Nina. Oh, but, but given the circumstances, um, Nina had it well in hand. Yeah. And of course, injection right up the ass. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to paralyze you. Then we're going to monologue to you for a while. Because it's a soap. You got to do that. You got to have the monologue. You know, and and, in this case, it did not bother me. I think, you know, Shaw needs to take some lessons from Nina in when is appropriate to monologue and when is not. She had already incapacitated Ava. She could monologue until the cows came home. Exactly. Or, you know, Kiki. Um, Whereas, you know, Shaw had a little bit of a time crunch he did not account for. Um, And Nina, what is she... I'm concerned that, because we obviously we knew she was not thinking this through clearly, because she can't just turn up with the baby, because, you know, people are going to have known she wasn't pregnant, right? Yeah. But I think she's showing ha- just how far she's not thought this through, because she doesn't seem at all concerned uh, for the baby, in that she's she's planning on inducing labor, is what I got from what she was saying. Yeah. Because, you know, Ava said, oh, the baby's not due for a few weeks, and Nina was like, I don't worry about that, I got it taken care of. But premature babies can have a lot of health issues. Yep. And and Nina is so focused on getting the baby that she doesn't seem to be uh, preparing for that. Yeah, it's just, again, you know, Franco, to, 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 to compare it to Franco again, Franco at least appears to have thought everything through. He plans his insanity. Again, insane, not stupid. 
There, that that is the emphasis there, and, and as well. And I think p- part of it, you keep saying stupid, and I'm not saying that's that's wrong, but I think part of it is that she's just very impulsive. Yeah. You no, know, she she hears Silas is over at Nina's uh, at uh, Ava's house, and she freaks out, and then her mother is like, "Oh no, it's probably because he's seeing, you know, because he's a doctor," and she immediately comes down. You know, she threatens to put Rosalie on the list for, you know mildly disobeying her she's she's very um um uh, immature naive immature well i was no, not naive like, maybe but uh, i don't know yeah well stupid well, would not apply to her in this case apparently um <laughs> um i mean the the insane not stupid yeah definitely applies to franco uh nina insane and uh, well we'll, we'll, we'll use reckless that that's the word we'll go with insane and reckless there, there we go. That that's a better descriptor of Nina there, you know. You know, or or it might even retroactively work with Franco. He is insane, not reckless. That could work too. He's very calculating. Yes. You no know, reassuring Carly, soothing her minutes before he's about to, you know, call her a whore in front of everyone she cares about. Yeah, <laughs> and everyone he cares about too, because Kiki's there, his dad's right. there, and I'm pretty sure he cares about both of them. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure. Yeah, although and and you know the night before the wedding, you know he and he and Scott had their bonding moment. I thought that was a really nice touch. Because yeah. I mean, even in the even in the middle of all this insanity that Franco was planning, he and Scott have the, get to have like a father son bonding moment. And you know he talks to Franco about uh, his brother Logan, who who was shot. I, I, I think it was stabbed or whatever in self defense. Stabbed by Lulu. Yeah. Yeah. Is you know, and and I seem to remember reading at first Scott was like really pissed at her, and then he realized what happened. He calmed down. He's like, okay, you know, you know. Oh yeah, I, I was actually kind of surprised how he told it to Franco because he, I mean, he wanted to prosecute Lulu. Mm-hmm. He was furious. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's definitely come a long way um, from that. Although you know, and I was very glad that he finally did talk to um, Franco about Logan. Mm-hmm. But I think. Um, when when they first sort of had the reveal of Franco's parents, um, I I've been I've been wanting to Scotty to tell Franco about his other siblings, like ever since it happened, and he still I don't think has told him about all of his siblings. Scotty has a lot of kids, <laughs> which is weird when you think about it because you almost never see him with any of them, and they usually pop up like one at a time and then go off again. Mm-hmm. But he has I think. I can't remember if it's either four or five total, including Franco. Let's see, I know um, there's Franco, Logan. Let's see, Franco, Logan, Serena, and I think there was baby Christina was... from Port Charles. I don't I don't remember. It, 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 she wasn't biologically his, or maybe Christina was more Lucy's Christina. But yeah, but obviously different Christina, not not the uh not the uh, spawn of Alexis and Sonny. Um Right. But uh but yeah, that goes into a little bit of Port Charles lore too, uh, as in the show, not the city lore. Just to to clarify to everybody. Um, but I think she was the biological daughter of Julie and Frank on that show, and then Lucy and Doc ended up adopting her because, well, Lucy was insane. Not Lucy, I'm sorry. Julie was insane. Um, and Frank didn't know until after everything was done. So. I don't remember exactly how all that planned out and what happened to that particular character. I don't know if she's, I don't know if she's dead or or what have you. Um, but I can't think of any other kids that that Scott might have had, other than uh, than the, the definite three: Franco, Logan, and Serena. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, I found it. Oh. Karen Wex. Oh, that's right, Karen. Oh, yeah, I, I so forgot about her. So it's Karen. Karen's mother was Rhonda Wexler. She had a relationship with Jagger Cates, and then there was Logan, who turned up long lost son style, killed by Lulu. Um, mm-hmm. Karen, I know, is dead. I can't remember how she died. I want to say she um, was killed in a car accident. That's very possible. And then Serena, who was, I believe, Lucy carried her as a surrogate for mm-hmm. Dominique yes. uh, and Scott, and then. Um, Christina, I believe, is biologically, yeah, you're right, Julian Franks, and then adopted by 
I have it here as Lucy and Scott who huh. adopted her. Although hmm. she, that could be that yeah. could have changed, or you know, could be not quite accurate. Yeah. So five kids. Uh, two of them. Confirmed. Deceased. Yeah, confirmed. The other one, one may not even exist anymore. She may have been retconned out. Uh, fair enough. But there, we do have at least Serena, who is, as far as we know, still living. They mentioned her, I think, a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know that Franco knows about her yet. No, uh, but I'm sure he'll find out eventually. Uh, some, I, I have a feeling at some point something's gonna have to bring Serena to town, yeah. and, you know, it would be great if they had the same actress play her too. Actually, when when the uh, One Life to Live three were getting their new characters, I thought Kristen Alderson was going to be Serena. Oh, really? And I was, yeah, I was a little disappointed that she wasn't. Well, I don't know if the age was quite right, but... Oh, uh, let's see, I want to say... Oh, God, what was it, like, 98, 99? I, I was watching Poor Charles. She was... Da, 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 da. She would be 20... I think the character would be in her early 20s. So she'd be around yeah. Kiki's age. So. Oh, well. Yeah, you know, if if they decide to not, you know, age her up more. So, but yeah. Um so yeah, where 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 else where else have we not gone? Cuz we went on a while about Franco and about Nina. Um Oh, oh, and on a little bit of a tangent there, uh, Silas, you know, he called in everybody going to get some more blood work. So they're going to find out pretty quick that the tests were wrong. Yeah. And I, No, I think in addition to the the uh, in show reason to get Silas out of the house, I think the behind the scenes reason is to just get Danny to the hospital again so we can run into um, Jake yes. or Jason. Yes, because that's that's gonna be oh man! I, I look forward to the day that Jason regains his memory. Mm-hmm. That's gonna be is gonna be fun. Uh, you know what we haven't talked about yet? What have we have not talked about yet? Sonny and Morgan. Ah, yes, that was going to be one of the next things I go to. Oh, because Morgan confronted Sonny about, well, well everything. And he, he's like, okay, you know, you know, and what prompted him to do this was somebody watching the brownstone, not realizing, realizing it was Madeline. So, you know, Morgan storms off to go confront Sonny and be like, what the fuck you watching that? What the fuck are you watching the house for? And he reveals Ava's there after Sonny says, after Sonny first confesses to Morgan that yes, he killed AJ, but Ava also killed Connie. And Morgan, after hearing that Ava had killed Connie, he says, yeah, I, you know, she's at the brownstone, man. Oh, yeah. Over, yeah. And I oversimplify. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Some, I do. There was some Oh God, great, that was great. great arc. I mean, even just in that scene, um, because Morgan didn't just, you know, oh, why are you watching the brownstone? I mean, he tried to make a deal with Sonny for Ava's safety, which I thought was pretty ballsy of him. Yeah. Um, and then um, when uh, when Sonny told him, he didn't believe him at first, and it wasn't until Sonny actually played in the recording of Ava kind of, like, taunting AJ mm-hmm. that he really believed it. Yeah. yeah. And it, oh, it's breaking my heart because I wanted Morgan and Ava to work through this, and I, even after all that, I was a little surprised that Morgan just told Sunny where she was. Yeah, it's, it's like, very quick to turn on Ava there, the woman that you care for and that you love. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess finding out that she did something horrible to somebody else you love is a hell of a thing. I I just don't know if it's it's a, I don't I just don't know. Is is it logically possible to turn on somebody that quickly even if you love them that much or I don't know. It's complicated because I think he's he'd been dealt such a blow by her already. Mm-hmm. Um you know, her sleeping with Sunny. Yeah. It was so hard for him and he's not you know he's been helping her with this but it's they hadn't really i mean they hadn't quite moved past it you know they had not rekindled their romantic relationship he's only just come around to the idea of the baby being part of his life uh-huh. and i think this was just you know too much now in real life i don't think that's something you can get past 
with all the murdering and the lying, whatever. Given that it's a soap, I'm still kind of hoping they work through it. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm kind of hoping Morgan and Sunny show up at the Brownstone together to, like, get Ava or whatever, and, and maybe rescue her from Nina. Yeah. Hopefully Morgan, big save. Um, because I think there's still definitely a part of him that cares very deeply for her. Right. Even if he's hurting now. Yeah. Just... Uh, and 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 of course the scene, this, you know, you you were brought up, you brought up a lot of stuff. I just want to comment on the acting on that on on those scenes. It, they were they were great. Scenery, what scenery? Is there any scenery left? <laughs> I mean, I, that, that, that's one of the things I really do enjoy is all the scenery chewing too. You get the emotions, you get you get the charge and everything, but you know scenery's getting chewed. And and I just want to say in particular, to, kudos to Brian Craig mm-hmm. for holding his own opposite Maurice Bernard. Yes, because... Such a powerhouse. Yes, he, he is going to go places. Yeah. He, he, we, we will keep an eye on him. Maybe two. <laughs> or in my case, maybe four. <laughs> and I know somebody's going to be like, well, but your title card has no glasses. I normally wear glasses. <laughs> you know, I'm like some other people in my circle. Just saying. Uh, because you know there's some pedant- pedantic asshole that's going to be like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, Sonny and Morgan. Oh, god damn. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm just waiting because you know it's eventually going to become a big damn heroes moment for uh, Sonny and Morgan to come in and find Nina over Ava and end up <laughs> saving her to save the baby. Or... Mm-hmm. They come in to save Ava, and Nina's already taken the baby and left. Oh, damn. And then, then what'll happen to Ava, I wonder? Uh. Uh, I, if it comes to that, I I don't think Morgan would let Sonny kill her. No. Uh. He would jump in front of the bullet before he, he... He might be angry, but I think when it comes down to it, he, he'd stop Sonny. Yeah, I, I I like to think you're right. I would like to think you're right on that one, but will, time will tell. Time will definitely tell. And uh, my cheat sheet doesn't show it, but the yeah, you know, like the night before Halloween, they had what what was it? Beggars Night. Oh yeah, Beggars Night. It's like it's like okay, that's a new one. I guess that's kind of an excuse that way. You know, the big Halloween stuff being the wedding and everything. Of course, you can't have costumes all going around. So they wrote in Beggars Night, which is something I had never heard of before until this Same, year. Same, yeah. So, um, it, it it was cute, um, but just I mean, totally blown out of the water by everything that happened after. I like forgot about it until you just brought it up, even. Yeah, well, that's okay. They, hey, you know, some weeks we're gonna forget we're gonna forget a thing until the next week. Sometimes. You know, like last week, we both forgot Nathan running around looking for Nina, and 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 everything. And even this week, there's this like one thing with Nathan, and he talks to Diane about you know you know for legal advice about Maxie, and right. and Diane unfortunately doesn't think there's anything she can do. Well, not strictly true. I love this moment now that you've reminded me. Uh-huh. Diane says we you know we could. Appeal or, or, or whatever, um, but if it goes wrong, we could risk, you know, him retaliating on Maxie and Maxie then, you know, not having her, her child back. So when Maxie comes in and asks, oh, is there anything you can do? Nathan lies. Yeah. And tells her, nope, there's absolutely nothing because he doesn't want to risk it to protect Maxie because he. he whether or not Maxie would actually go for it, he's concerned that Maxie would want to fight, mm-hmm. and he is sacrificing his chance with her to ensure that she gets her daughter back. Which I lying and stuff generally does not play out well in soaps when the yeah. when the truth comes out. But it kind of made me love Nathan even more. Yeah, I have to I have to agree with that one. Um, just it's it it might come back and bite him in the ass. But he's he's doing it to protect her because, as he has stated, he doesn't want, not want to come between her and her daughter, and I think that's very very noble of him. And 
You know, he's he's a bigger man for it, and and other guys probably wouldn't worry about it. We know one guy that didn't worry about it, and look what happened to him. Oh wait, he got stabbed in the back. <laughs> Fuck Levi. <laughs> Fuck him. Just just, I'm, I'm glad he's dead. Uh, although he probably won't stay dead because well, you know, look where he died. Um. <laughs> uh, him and his father, they'll probably be back at some point. He goes, hey, you know, Helena's running around doing things. She might have grabbed those bodies and be like, hey, we could use these and, and just put them in the deep freeze and bring them back to life because they have the technology to do that. Uh, I mean, hey, they have the technology to bring Helena shot in the heart and then dumped in the ocean back from the dead. So, you know, uh, I, I, I think another gunshot and, and a stab victim, I, I think they, it's within their power. Um... Uh, I think the Cassidines are necromancers. <laughs> that That's... Oh, God. Is that going to be a theme on my podcast this week? Because on Thespian Talk, we brought up necromancy, and now I'm bringing it up here. Oh, that's going to be a theme. Uh, just just watch. <laughs> oh, lordy. So, so okay. We, we covered Nathan and, 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 and everything there. Oh, there was something... Something else that we oh yeah, oh yeah back to uh, beggars night because a few things that do play into the wedding come in uh, Jocelyn and 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 uh, 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 Spencer you know they they make the plans to to pretty much go to the wedding as plus one that's how Spencer ended up getting there in the first place because he became Jocelyn's plus one um, and, and it's a rehash of everything that happened what was it last not not, not this. Was it this summer? I think it was this summer or was it the previous summer or whatever with um, you know, Rafe and Molly and all of them. That particular plot line. And it's like, really? You're going to rehash this with the kids? Yeah, I'm, I'm really annoyed. To be fair, they did at least acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Spencer alluded to that's where he got the idea for the plan. Yeah. Um, but it's so annoying. Yeah. Um, it was an annoying plot when they did it the first time with teenagers who would actually realistically be having relationship drama mm-hmm. but doing it with the eight year olds is just, just no unpleasant. no and then, and of course they are all gonna grow up they're gonna have the other dramas going on just watch by the time they're by the time they are all of legal age and can actually be shown doing this they will they will all have probably you know banged every every other person and that's really disturbing because they're kids right now but it's it's a fact of life. When they get old, when they become teenagers, they're gonna have all the sex with each other, you know. Okay. Well, the show's doing a good enough job already sexualizing them. Let's not talk about their future yeah. sex lives yet. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I and I understand. It's it's a, a bit disturbing to think about, but uh, that's where my brain goes. Oh, I'm I'm making myself sad. So I'm gonna talk about Brit and how pretty she is. Okay. <laughs> because. Because Brit is still showing, you know, she's being an awesome mother figure to Spencer. Which is hilarious to me, given how crappy she was with Emma. Yeah. But I think maybe it's, it's a personality thing. Because um, hey. Spencer and Brit, I just love together. Mm-hmm. Um, they... They don't. It's not that they bring out exactly the best in each other. They kind of encourage each other's worst ideas. Yeah. Like the whole running away thing. Um, but they really care about each other, and it's very sweet. Yeah. Um, how you know he, even when she's not with Nick, he looks to her as as a mother figure, and she still cares about him. And she, even when she's not like using, she's because she's not using him to get close to Nick the way she kind of tried to use Emma to yeah. get close to Patrick. So it is a very sweet relationship, although not exactly a healthy one in all ways. Yeah. Although I will I will say that possibly part of it is due to some of the character development with Britt, because I know like when she was pregnant and, and that whole thing was going on is when she met Nicholas and those two bonded over 4th of July. That may have been, you know, kind of the start of it, because he's showing genuine, you know, interest in her. Right. And, and I think she had mentioned she wasn't used to that. Yeah, because we never saw Patrick really actually show that much interest in her. If I remember correctly, they only had a one-night stand before she, you know, impregnated herself. Yeah. Uh, I seem to remember uh, something about a shower 
romp or something like that, which admittedly kind of hot, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah, she, from what I gathered, she, you know, she had her flings and everything, you know, she got around and, you know, Nicholas is the first person who looked at her not as just somebody that wants to bone her or, or whatever, you know, as somebody who would be, you know, worth getting to know, worth, worth more than just the sex, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, and that touched her. And, and she realized, hey, you know, this is a really great guy. You know, I want to, you know, and start to do better, even with all of the bullshit that's going on and the stuff that she has to pull to to keep up the, the ruse and, and the stuff that's going on, the, the horrible stuff that's going on. And, and it's nice, kind of a, I guess, a side note, but with um, with that sort of arc of Brits, um, Brad has followed a very similar arc. And so they've both had this kind of, they both come from this place where they didn't really have anyone that really cared about them. The pseudo relationships they'd had were were all about sex and people using them, and they they used each other at first, and then they, now they they've both kind of gotten to this place where they're actually very good friends that actually very much care about each other, and they've both got these relationships with people who care about them for them, and not like you're saying just about the sex. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately for Brit, hers has a built-in time bomb, but Brad and Lucas seem to be doing pretty well so far, and it's really sweet to see both those um, both those couples kind of, at least temporarily, making it work, you know, given where both Brad and Brit started. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, and, and another side note is like, because oh, my brain is going there, you know, their parentage is like, Brad is the son of a mobster, and Brit's the daughter of Cesar Faison. So it's like kind of also maybe a kindred spirits thing too, which might which might help with with Nicholas and Lucas too, you know their respective uh, mates because you know Lucas he's Julian Jerome's son, Nicholas he's a Cassadine. We know his father is Stavros. It's like the the white sheep of all of these you know <laughs> bad guy families finding each other. It's kind of sweet. It is. I actually and then really hope we see more of. Brad's family, or more of that kind of, um, more of the backstory of, of his family, and, and hopefully maybe they'll introduce some of those characters, um, you know, allude back to whenever it was the 80s that that, that family was big, um, you know, maybe they go way back with the Jeromes, and yeah. that can all play up. I would just really like to see, you know, Brad and Lucas playing a more front-runner role, and not just kind of having the background romantic yeah subplot scenes which are very cute but i want to see more of them in the forefront definitely definitely and also one one uh thing that was uh that was kind of alluded to when uh what's her name uh, uh taylor i think i think her name was uh felix's sister yeah taylor yeah you know when she was around she was you know she blackmailed felix into letting him, her stay with him with, for, with some kind of secret or what have you that his parents don't know about i think mm-hmm. and I don't think we've ever found out what it was. I mean, I, I'm i assuming it's simply it might be a simple thing of he's not out to his parents. Yeah, I and, think that was the prevailing theory at the time. Yeah, and considering where he's from, I think he's from, what, North Carolina? I don't remember. Yeah, you know, one of the Carolinas, I think. And wow. especially knowing, like, especially in the real world where... You know where I, you know, again, my other two shows are uh, current events shows, so I keep an eye on a lot of things. And oh, some of the news coming out of North Carolina, there's a bunch of uh, racist homophobes coming out of the Carolinas. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I uh, I went to school in South Carolina, so well aware. Yeah, so so you know Definitely. what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, I could I could see where that would be the big thing that he's simply just not out to his parents. And Taylor is using that. And but you know, we'll we'll probably never find out unless they bring Taylor back from wherever she's disappeared to, and maybe even get like their parents on. Um, that's you know another character that I really like to see a little bit more in the forefront and not kind of getting these sort of subplot scenes. Yeah, um, definitely. Or you know, best friend giving advice kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, he had that sort of brief storyline where he figured out that. No, he did not want to have a threesome. Yeah. Which was great, but I I want more than that for him. 
Yeah. And I really want Taylor back. Yeah, that would be that would be great if as long as they can do more with her than just you know teenage quadrangle thing. I don't know why they call it quadrangles. I mean, I know it's supposed to be you know four way love triangle and everything, but I, I just think quadrangle is a funny word. It's just it's well, just funny. Hopefully, with Rafe's death, they can sort of move past the like love triangle crap, and maybe they can all like, become friends and have adventures and and have storylines besides you know pitting girls against each other over stupid teenage boys. You know, yeah, maybe possibly. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, oh god, and and f- the last thing I do want to touch on is um, Anna. Anna, it, it seems like she's getting a little closer to maybe figuring, at least figuring out, even if she doesn't have any proof yet, that it might, Sonny had something to do with AJ's murder because of, you know, because of Michael telling her, yeah, you know, Carlos is kind of recanting on his thing. He told Sabrina, and I, 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 I don't remember if Michael outright believes Sabrina, but I don't think he has any reason to believe she would be lying or that or anything. So, and of course, coming from Michael, Anna would probably trust him. She's following up on it, and she questioned Julian. Julian's like, you know what? I don't know. And if you want to try and know more, if you want to try and question me again, call my lawyer. That sort of thing. And and Anna and Dante are sitting there figuring all of this out. And Anna's like, okay, uh, this might be difficult, but I, I think your father has something to do with it. And Dante is like, you know what? I can handle it because I'm thinking the same thing. So once that comes, oh lordy, everybody in town is going to be all over Sunny once it comes out, mm. for good or for ill. And honestly, I've, I've said it before. Currently, Sunny is not my favorite character because of just how he has been acting towards everybody. Mm-hmm. And so it's like to see him get some kind of comeuppance and not be shown to be this invent, you know, while emotion. While he does have his weaker emotional moments, you know, legally and, and otherwise invincible mobster brought down a few pegs to where he re- you know, where he is smacked and realizes, yeah, I'm not as invincible as I thought I was when it comes to these other things, especially the law. <laughs> you know, everything that he's been trying to do is going to bite him in the ass hard. His and Anna's scene was really fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot with them kind of trading barbs and playing off each other. Um, and to me, like, I, in theory, I like Anna. Yeah. But I'm often bored by her scenes. Like, I don't find her and Duke very compelling. Um, you know, with Robin gone, she hasn't had as many of the, you know, family moments and everything. So I, I kind of tune out a little bit when she's on a lot but with her and Sunny like that was a lot of fun and if I could watch just them kind of playing around each other kind of cat and mouse whatever for the next few weeks or so that I would enjoy yeah that would be enjoyable and what I would also enjoy you know in terms of writing that that I've noted uh, Namio has definitely noted it before is um you know write the PCPD maybe a little more competently because some of the things that people get away with is pretty much due to incompetence you know on the part of the PCPD I mean why not have a villain or somebody get away with something because of the villain's competence level being high you know just just being out there you know and the police are working as hard as they can and it's showing that they're working as hard as they can they're co- showing that they're covering every corner and, and every nook and cranny that they can and, and I know they do that to some degree but there's still the, like that degree of incompetency that goes on within the PCPD and I know it's I know it's for drama and everything but I honestly think that that's one of those things that you know, that that they can do better I think um, I don't know if you agree with me on that but <laughs> You know, yes and and no. If we, I get, I think it's a a bit of a trade off mm-hmm. in that if we want the PCPD to be competent, which I I do to a degree, but then again, like so many of like even the protagonists would be in jail for various shenanigans. You know, if you're writing the police to be really competent, mm-hmm. then either everyone is going to become a criminal mastermind, or we're going to lose half the cast to Pentonville. 
Yeah, this is a good point. <laughs> oh, but yeah, so with, with that, we are going to get out of here for this week. And I, 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 I have to make myself not do motor mouth when I, I do my stuff. But, um,. But uh, my co-host here, Julia, she doesn't have that bad of a problem with the end of show motor mouth. And uh, so with that, I ask, where could we find you if we wanted to find you on the social medias? That would be gh-musings.tumblr.com. Sweet! And me, besides everything that's going to be in the the closing bumper, you'll hear that in just a few seconds. Uh, You can find me on rtgomer.com and nerdvice.com and you can find me on the social medias on Twitter and on Tumblr at gomer21xx. So, yes, thank you guys for listening. We will catch you next time. And until then, this is Gomer the Ranting Thespian with Julia, signing off. The Port Charlie Podcast is an R.T. Gomer Productions presentation. Our show's theme is The Complex by Kevin McLeod. Find out more at Incompetech.com. If you like this show and want to help support future episodes, head over to Patreon.com slash Gomer21XX. For a contribution as little as a dollar per production, you can get early access to all future productions, as well as monthly patron-only vlogs and announcements. Our show's artwork was produced by the talented Becky Hopkins, who can be commissioned by going to Patreon.com slash Becky Hop. Check us out on iTunes or visit rtgomer.com for more great shows.